Thank you for that, sir. Great message. Appreciate how he sang that. I'm always thankful to come to First Baptist Church. Touched by the music here, we're blessed with a number of talented individuals who are willing to use their talent for Jesus Christ. Thank you for that. And I was thinking this morning, we had a number of pianists here too at First Baptist Church. Boy, we can uh, we can go a few pianists deep here and still be a okay. I'm I'm, I'm glad for that. I'm, all I'm saying is I love being here at First Baptist Church. It's been a good service, and you sang well this morning. Praise the Lord for that. If you have your Bibles, open it in Second Samuel chapter number six. Second Samuel chapter number six. I have some dad jokes here, but I'm going to save them for tonight. Not because I like them, because I'm not a big dad joke fan, and my kids will tell you every once in a while, but yeah, but uh, I know, Mark, I know you love them. I know you love them. So you have to come back now tonight for sure, because I, I, I got some new material for you. Oh, boy. But um, <clears throat> our time is short this morning, but I have a, a message from Second Samuel chapter 6 I think is fitting for today. It is not a Father's Day message. Tonight will be. Uh, this one's just from, from God's Word, bringing back the ark out of, out of our series, Fabulous Lessons from the Life of the First Three Kings. Studying this particular passage, the Lord touched me about a few things. About how we are guilty of the same idea, the same concept that David was when he tried to bring back the ark of God. Second Samuel chapter 6, we're going to read a few minutes the account of what took place here, what happened. Some will be familiar with the story, the account. Some will be brand new. But I want you to think about something this morning. I want you to contemplate something this morning. And the reality is, the fact is, that our intentions are not good enough. We fall into a mindset, we fall into a trap that if we intend to do well, that no matter what happens, God should be happy, no one should be annoyed, no one can be offended because my motive was right. Now, motives are important. God gives that to us. He wants us to have a clean inside and a clean outside. But we're going to read in this account, read in the story, and I think you're going to see what I'm trying to point out that motives are not enough. Just because you have good intentions, and I titled this message, but I meant, or subtitled it, but I meant well. Dads, to throw in a little Father's Day thing, have you ever had that response from your kid? Yeah, but, but, but I tried, but, but I meant to do this. And there they are standing in front of something that is ruined, broken, demolished, on fire. At that point, dads, when this flaming hunk of junk is there in front of you, you don't care that they meant well, do you? Oh, well, that solves everything. Because you meant well, well, we don't care about this, whatever the disaster may be. Let's look, if we can, in 2 Samuel chapter number 6, beginning in verse number 1, where the Bible says, again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel 30,000. Now, I'll pause a couple times. I'm going to pause right here. This was an event. This, my friends, was not just a small a gathering of people. This was 30,000 of the chosen men of Israel. If I can, this was a who's who's event. David says, we're going to do this, and I want 30,000 of the chosen men to go with me. This is going to be quite the event. David's not trying to go half-hearted here. David's not trying to cut any corners here. David says, listen, we're going to make this something big, something fabulous, something grand. This is going to be great. 30,000. Verse number two, and David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out to the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. 
And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps, and on psalteries, and on timbrels, and on cornets, and on cymbals. Now do me a favor real quick and let's play the imagination game for just a moment. Adults, I know some of you are older, but you can still imagine things. Kids have great imaginations. I love that about them. Boy, they can make believe with a stick, right, and a, and a piece of corn, and boy, and, and play a game for hours. Adults, let's get back to imagination for just a second and put yourself there with David. 30,000 of the chosen men of Israel. Beyond that, they've come and they've built a brand new cart. I imagine that no expense was spared in the building of this cart. This was not, I imagine, based on what I read in this particular account, I don't think that David slapped together a couple of two-by-fours and some duct tape. I think he built this cart, and it was top-notch. They placed the ark on this cart and began to transport it back to Israel. And all along the way, the Bible says in verse number 5 that there is just a worship, celebration, joyful noise going on. You see that in verse number 5? All the house of Israel, they played before the Lord on all manner of instruments. Fir wood, harps, psalteries, timbrels, cornets, and on cymbals. Now, I don't think that that verse implies that it was like a K-5 room, everybody grabbed their own instrument. Oh, I get the cymbals today and I just crash away. You, you've heard these chaotic things before. I don't believe that happened at all. That's not the way the Israelites did music there. We see many times where they practiced and they planned and they, and they were together. So, but this was a huge orchestra, all right, of accompaniment, like accompanying this cart down the road. So you can imagine with 30,000 people, uh, men, and I doubt they stood silently by, plus all these instruments and a brand new cart, that this was quite the noise, quite the caravan coming down the road. Right? Can you picture that? Am I making this up? You can see that in the scripture, right? I mean, this was, this was an event. There's was about 50,000 people, they say, in Saginaw. Can you imagine 30,000 of them marching and singing all in joyful songs, making noise before the Lord? That's what's happening before the Lord. Can you imagine that? It would cause others to stop and think, what is going on? Listen, if a thousand of us go down the road and start singing, people will stop and say, what's going on? So that's 30,000 with cornets and cymbals and timbrels and psalteries and harps and all these things. Verse number six. When they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. Dumb cattle. Don't you know what's going on? Don't you know what you're carrying? Don't you know what we're doing today, you dumb cattle? Don't you know that we're transporting the ark of God back to Israel? Don't you know we're, we're moving the physical rep- representation of the presence of God from a strange land, from the place it's not supposed to be, back to where it's supposed to be? Can't you hear the noise? Can't you see the men? What are you doing shaking the ark of God? Well, cattle do what cattle do. Cattle begin to shake. Ark appeared in Uzzah's view, perspective, to become unsettled. And Uzzah put out his hand so that God wouldn't fall down. No one likes their God to fall. My my friend, don't forget this. (laughs) You can't prop up God. If you have to prop up God, it's the wrong God. Okay? So Uzzah put up his hand. Verse number 7. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. Beginning of verse 8, and David was displeased. Lord, I pray you'd help us in these next brief moments that we have. Lord, I pray that you would help your word to be clear, that your message would come through. 
Lord, help me to communicate the truth in a way that would honor you and that would help us to understand the truth here. And Lord, I pray that there's someone here who doesn't know you as their Savior, never trusted you, that today they would turn from their sin and turn to you. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. Can you picture what happened here? Huge celebration, party, joy, noise, no expense share, uh, spared in this operation. And a little ways home, for the first part, everything's going just fine. For the first part, everything is wonderful, just like we planned it. For the first part, the cart's moving just fine. The people are singing just fine. Everyone's happy just fine. But all of a sudden, trouble hits. All of a sudden, there's a little bit of turmoil in the path. All of a sudden, there's a bump in the road. Just like we will all face bumps in the road. It was years ago now, but... Uh, got into a car that, that one person in my family had driven before me. It wasn't me. It could have been my wife, but I'm not saying who. And I noticed that the, uh, the radiator wasn't holding the fluid like it normally had before. You know that in cars that radiators hold fluid? They do, and this one um, had, a, had a little bit of a leak in it. And I said, well, that's weird. So I asked someone else in my household, Nameless. I said, honey. <laughs> I said, the radiator seems to be leaking. I said, honey, did you hit something? Nope. And then she goes, oh. Then they remembered, oh, the speed bump. You ever hit a speed bump before? Over 30? How about in life? You ever hit a life speed bump before? Over 30? Now listen, I tease, my, I tease my wife about that, but I've done far worse to vehicles. If she starts telling stories, I've gotten more accidents than she ever has. All right, deer, semi-trucks, it just happens. I'm a magnet, apparently, she says. Hit a bump. Hit a bump, and, and Uzzah was concerned for the ark of God, and so he, he stuck up his hand. The problem being that God said no one could touch the ark of God. And God wasn't making exceptions, even though the motives were pure. I want you to notice just two thoughts this morning. One, the first thought is this, the motives were phenomenal. The motives were phenomenal. There was a great need. You see, the children of Israel had come, and, and what had happened was Saul had taken the ark because the children of Israel, Saul thought that if they just took the ark, that God would help them win. They forgot that the ark wasn't as important as God is. Or it wasn't the ark, it was God himself. God just chose the ark as a, as a representation of himself. And so Saul had, had, had taken the ark, and it had, been, it had been taken, it had been taking the Philistines, and it had been causing them just a heap of problems. So the Philistines finally got rid of it. It's sitting in a place, and the place it was sitting in Gibeah was just all getting all blessed. And so David's like, listen, we got to get the ark back to Jerusalem. We got to get the ark back to where it's supposed to be with the people of God. So the motive was phenomenal. David realized, listen, we need God right here. If that's where God's going to represent himself, we want that right here. Nothing wrong with David's motives. David said, listen, I may have some short-term games, but I need God. I need him right here. And my friend, you and I, we need God. When we come to church, we look for God to touch us. I pray for God to meet with us. We need God phenomenal motive a genuine desire it looks it, I look at the life of Saul the first king of Israel Saul seemed to only want God when he needed help but David seemed to always turn back to God you know that some people merely see God as a paramedic God I need you I'll dial my spiritual 911 and God, you can drive your ambulance to me, and I'll be okay, and then you can go on your merry way. But my friends, God is not your, just your paramedic who you call when you're in trouble. Some people see God as a paramedic. Other people see God as a paratrooper. Lord, I'm in a battle right now, and I need someone to drop in and save the day. And here we want God like Tarzan swinging here, I come to save the day. Is that Tarzan or somebody like that? 
God's not a paratrooper, though he could come in and save us out of any day of the week. Some people see God as a paramedic. Some people see God as a paratrooper. Some people see God as a paralegal. Lord, I need some good advice today. I've got three decisions to make, and Lord, I'm going to dial my paralegal, and I need some advice, and you give me my options, and it'll be great. And God has infinite wisdom, does he not? But God's not just a paralegal. Some people see God as a paraprofessional. Call him when I need some assistance. God, will you hold this for me? Almost like God joins us and holds the wrench while we do something over here. My friends, God is not just a paramedic, a paratrooper, a para, paraplegal, or a paraprofessional. David viewed God as paramount to success. Only God. Tremendous desire. Genuine desire. Joyful celebration. 30,000 men. Beautiful worship music. Sight to behold, a sound to be overwhelmed with, a story to be a part of. The problem was it's not just the thought that counts. Right now we're in the middle of NBA Finals. Apparently last night there was a Game 7 between two teams, the Brooklyn Nets and the Milwaukee Bucks. Game 7. Maybe some of you watched part of it. If you did, you would know that the game went into overtime. Game went over time, and one of the teams, the Milwaukee Bucks, came out victorious. I did not watch the end celebration. I don't know what happened, but I can kind of predict a few things, having watched other sporting events. In a game seven, both teams have a chance to win. In a game seven, both teams have a desire to win. In a game seven, both teams have an opportunity to win. By the end of the game, there was just one winner, the Milwaukee Bucks. I imagine if I were to go back and look at the Brooklyn Nets and see the team at the end of the game, I doubt that they would be in celebration after they lost. I doubt they'd be saying, you know what, guys? We lost game seven, but we had good intentions. We made a good effort. You know what? We want a celebration too. You know what? We should deserve the same money, the same recognition, because we had the same intentions as they did over there. They happened to score more points. We scored less points. If we were playing golf, we would have won. But our intentions, our motives were good. No, I doubt, I didn't watch it, but I doubt, if I were to go back and watch it, like, and you know this, right? I doubt they'd be like, oh, this is good. They'd be saying, oh my goodness. Heads down, right? Maybe a towel over their head. Sometimes, the small boys that they are, kick a chair along the way out. I'm not talking about size. I'm talking about uh, integrity and character, right? They understand that the motives and intentions weren't enough. And though the motives here were phenomenal, the method was flawed. The problem with this particular account we'll begin this week comes in verse number three where the simple words say this, and they set the ark of God upon a new cart. The problem was that God never said to move the ark of the covenant on a new cart. He didn't say to move it on an old cart. He didn't say move it on a big cart or move it on a small cart. He said the only way you're supposed to move this thing is to carry it. Now that was God's instructions. You can argue with it. You can disagree with it. You can say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why does God want it carried? I don't know. He didn't say why he wanted it carried. He just said that he wanted it carried. He said, this is the way you'll transport this. Carry it. Carry it. He had some specific ways to carry it. The method was flawed. They didn't listen to what God wanted. They didn't follow what God had said. And God was displeased with their actions. Now get this, everything else in this account, the death, and everything else we'll look at even next week, hinged upon their decision to not obey God. Everything else hinged upon this seemingly small decision to just do things a little bit differently. They were still bringing the ark back. They were still doing the only thing they changed 
was instead of carrying it, they put it on a cart. But it was a new cart. It was a special cart. It had never been used for anything else before. Lord, of course you'll like this cart. This is the cart we built for you. So you should be happy with what we did for you. Our intentions were good. Our motives are pure. God, don't you just, or don't you just see the inside? No, God doesn't just see the inside. But God does see the inside. We see this in life. Well, as long as, as long as we have a good result, as long as our motives are pure, and our desire to become close to God, we must remember to follow his ways. Here it is, folks. Listen to this. Churches are full of believers who sincerely desire to draw close to Jesus Christ yet never seem to do it much because good intentions are not enough. If you want to go on a diet, intentions aren't enough, are they? I'm going to start tomorrow. I'm going to start next week. Yes, I am. Yep, next week, no more sugar. Hey, honey, I made you a cake. Ooh, I'll start, I'll start later on. Oh, I, I, I would start that diet, but, but it's vacation coming up. Everyone knows you can't die on vacation. Oh, that's terrible. Oh, it's open house season. Oh, there's weddings. Always an excuse. Our intentions are good, but intentions won't help you lose a single pound. They'll just help you lose a lot of days. A lot of Christians with good intentions, good intentions, sincerity. Hey, listen, I, I want to please God. But intentions are not enough. David's intentions were right, but his method was flawed. Intentions, it's not enough just to want to be close to God. It's not enough just to want to see people saved. It's not enough just to want to know more of the Bible. Good intentions need godly action to benefit in your life. You see, my friend, many of us are stuck in the same spot as David. We say, God, you should be pleased with what I'm doing. Because I mean well. Because my heart is good, Lord. It's in the right place. And God says, I'll tell you. God desires from us three things. He desires us to be, in our minds, singular. He desires us to have submission. He desires sincerity, all of us. Beyond that, James Ballswell said this, hell is paved with good intentions. See, good intentions affect all of us. I wonder this morning, brief moments that we had, if maybe your intentions are good, but your actions stink. Your intentions are good, your excuses are better, but still there's no change. You see, but I meant well doesn't bring about obedience. A Christian, we can mean well. We have to follow God. If you're here today and never trusted Jesus Christ, you can mean well. But that won't get you into heaven. Only trusting Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for this time. Lord, we need you. Lord, our intentions are not enough. Lord, we have intentions to Spend time with you, to draw close to you, to please you. But Lord, we need to follow and obey you. What if you're here this morning, my friend, you say, Pastor, as you spoke, God was speaking to me. Would you pray for me? I, I have intentions. They're good intentions. But God spoke to me because I realized this morning my intentions aren't enough would say, Pastor, would you pray for me this morning when you pray that God would help not only my intentions to be good, but my actions to be right before him. I'd obey the Lord. So say, that's me this morning. Would you slip your hand up? God bless you. Hands all over. Who else? God bless you. Amen. What if you're this morning, you say, Pastor, I've never trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. If I died today, I don't know that I'd go to heaven. I have intention to go to heaven, but I've never trusted Jesus Christ. My friend, good intentions aren't enough. I would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, 
but I'd like to be sure today. When you pray for the others, would you pray for me? I'll draw no more attention to you than did anyone else. Just slip your hand up and say, that's me, Pastor. I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven. I've never trusted Jesus Christ. I'd like to be sure. I'd like to know. Slip it up and slip it down. We'll see you. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we need to obey you and follow you. Lord, our intentions aren't enough. Lord, those who have raised a hand this morning, would you help them to respond to you in obedience? Lord, realizing that what we want to do is not enough. Lord, bless the invitation. In Jesus' name, amen.